Hello everyone, this is Alexi George, and I want to welcome you to the subject, the class Hope in Suffering and Joy in Liberation. Um, I'm going to, I'm setting a timer here, and I, my idea is to make this video lecture about 15 to 20 minutes. So I set the timer for 15 minutes so that once the timer goes off, I could wrap up what I'm talking about. And um, uh, I'm not sure we're all learning how to do all of this, but um, uh, my attempt is to give you a brief 15 to 20 minute video. And, uh, the, and then we will have our class time together for a discussion. Now, of course, Monday morning, the first hour, 8.30 in the morning, we will meet this time. But actually, uh, if we look at uh, when I check the timetable, Monday, 8.30 in the morning is, the, is for those who are doing this in Hebrew. But I'm asking all of the students uh, in BD4 to come together at that time. Uh, then we will, we will try to figure out you know, who would like to do this subject in Hebrew uh, and how many would like to just simply do it in uh, English. And you will have that choice. And uh, I think some of you may have already registered for that uh, in Hebrew. So uh, I will get the list from our um, academic dean later on. Okay, so uh, let's see what, and, and today is the introductory, uh, like an introduction day. And, uh, and so basically what I want to do is, you know, kind of share with you what some of the things that I plan to uh, work on is one of this is this we will do a video like this and then we'll have the discussion based on the video and any other questions you may have and i've sent this some uh, this message in the group already what you can do is in your phone using the youtube app you can download this video so that uh, once you press download so that you can watch it seamlessly without much delay and the other benefit is you can be you can uh, later come back to this video later and watch it again for review. Uh, so there are several benefits like this, and uh, and we can look at it afterwards. All right, um, let's uh, begin on the topic, and and we'll talk more as we go along regarding uh, quizzes, examinations, things like this. This subject we are dealing with. Um, uh, some very important matters in uh, in poetry and wisdom literature. And uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen with you. I have a PowerPoint that I want to share with you. And, uh, and you'll be able to see this PowerPoint. And uh, let's see. And I'll move my video to the bottom here so that it is kind of out of the uh, view, uh, out of the immediate view. All right, let's try this. Okay, I hope all of you will be able to see this. Hope and Suffering and Joy and Liberation is the title of the course. And uh, it is a study of Hebrew poetry and wisdom literature. Okay, so we have some objectives in this course. This is what the course, uh, this is what the Senate has determined that uh, they would like for you to know. Uh, and uh, to be able to accomplish. First, look into the polyphonic character of Hebrew poetry and wisdom traditions. The basic idea behind this polyphonic character is that it, uh, it, it has the basic word poly. So basically, uh, the many aspects or the many facets uh, of the Hebrew poetry's character there and wisdom tradition. There are many facets of it. And so, Basically, in this course, basically in this subject, we will just kind of, that's why the, the objective says look into. So we will be doing a kind of a cursory view of that, giving you a basic introduction. And hopefully using this, you'll be able to develop further and to learn further on Hebrew poetry and wisdom tradition and to study it uh, more on your own. So the second objective uh, is to look at the themes in the writings, which is the third division of the Hebrew Bible or the Tanakh, particularly in Hebrew poetry and wisdom. So we're going to look at some of the themes that are there and uh, what 
those themes are and uh, what we learn from the themes in these writings. Okay. Uh, third, we'll study in detail the book of Job and or Psalms and understand their main theological themes. So we'll take either Job or Psalms, one of those, and uh, we will look further into in detail. Uh, and then what we'll do is, you know, we, you will be able to, um, uh, you'll be required to do some exegesis on these as well. So we'll talk about exegesis and what that is and how to do exegesis and uh, you'll be doing exegesis. So those who are doing this subject in Hebrew, uh, along with the exegesis, you'll have some similar passages, but then for Hebrew, you'll have some others different and uh, you'll be translating uh, the, uh, the Hebrew text. And so it will take a little bit of a different track, but a lot of the things will be similar, but some, uh, some differences will be there as well. All right, let me just get rid of this. I don't know what happened here. Excuse me for a minute. All right. I think I touched somewhere and, uh, all right. Okay, continuing with the objectives. Uh, the last one, make exegetical experiments based on contextual and liberative readings of the selected text using available critical tools and methods. So uh, basically you'll be doing exegesis and the exegesis will be based on contextual and liberative readings of the text. Uh, the idea is um, you'll be looking at the text from the perspective of today's context. And, uh, and the liberative readings. That's the basic idea uh, behind how the exegesis will be done. All right, four things, right? Here we go. Uh, number one, the polyphonic character of the Hebrew poetry and wisdom tradition. So we'll spend some time talking about poetry and traditions, Hebrew poetry and traditions and all the different aspects of it. So that's what we'll do in the beginning part. Then we'll talk about some of the themes uh, in the wisdom writings and Hebrew poetry. Then we'll study in detail one of the books, either Job and or Psalms, and understand their main theological themes. Then we'll have some exegetical, we'll do some exegesis, and the exegesis will be for particular, uh, for the, uh, the, the, there, there are assigned passages that we will be working on the exegesis. Okay, uh, then we'll move right into our syllabus. The first portion is, um, we're talking about Hebrew poetry. And uh, the first aspect is genres of the Hebrew poetry. Uh, the idea behind the genre, actually the word genre often is used in a very broad sense to talk about different types of literature. But I think um, in this uh, syllabus, they're using the word genre to talk about the features and characteristics of Hebrew poetry. That's why I put that in brackets there. If you look in the, uh, in the syllabus, you will not find these words, features, and characteristics. You will not find those words there. I have added there, that here because uh, the genre is a different, it's a different meaning for genre. You can look it up in, uh, on the dictionary as well. Uh, the basic idea behind genre is different. Okay, so here are the different aspects or different features and characteristics of Hebrew poetry first. Uh, one of the characteristics of Hebrew poetry is that there is a terseness. Uh, what is the meaning of terseness? Terseness is, uh, means, that simply means neatly or effectively concise. It is brief and pithy as language. In other words, the words are few. Terseness frequently drops nouns or verbs or omits conjunctions. Uh, basic temporal indicators or logical connections. So terseness means that it's very brief and concise and, uh, and the language is very direct. All right, so what we'll do to give you a better idea, what does it mean that Hebrew poetry can be terse? What does that mean? Um, let's look at a sample, Judges chapter 5, verse 26 to 27. If any of you are taking notes, you can write down these passages. Uh, but then, of course, this video uh, will be available to you to watch later anyway. 
All right, Judges chapter 5, verse 26 and 27. Let's look at that together. Verse 26, she sent her hand to the tent peg and her right hand to the workman's mallet. She struck Sisera. She crushed his head. She shattered and pierced his temple. Between her feet, he sank. He fell. He lay still. Between her feet, he sank. He fell. Where he sank, there he fell. Dead. Okay? So, normally, if you're writing the story about what happened, uh, you would say, well, you know, she was there in the tent, and, uh, you know, this man had come, she she gave her something to drink, gave him something to drink, and he laid down, and it will go on like a story. And while he was sleeping, she took a tent peg and drove it through his temple, which is, we know the story, that uh, he's laying down, and uh, the tent peg, usually it's quite long, uh, she drove that tent peg through his head, and it went into the other side. But as poetry, it's not telling the story in a normal narrative sense. So it makes it neat and brief, and it increases the effectiveness of telling the story in a poetical fashion, rather than telling the story as narrative. Okay, so here it is. Let me read that once again. All right. She sent her hand to the tent peg. Even look at the words or, or, or that's used there as well, okay? She sent her hands to the tent peg and her right hand to the workman's mallet. She struck Sisera. She crushed his head. She shattered and pierced his temple. All right, that's that first verse there. Next verse. Between her feet, he sank. So there's the image of her with both her feet next to his head and just driving the tent peg down between her feet. He sank, he fell, he lay still. Okay, so here's a mighty man, powerful man, but there he is, dead. Okay, this lady, she's able to put him down and he's dead and gone forever. Between her feet, he sank, he fell. Where he sank, there he fell, dead. Okay, so uh, here it is, frequently drops, nouns or verbs. Okay, so normally you would not talk like this, but because it is Hebrew poetry, it makes everything brief and to give it a special effect. Okay, so the first aspect of Hebrew poetry or characteristic of Hebrew poetry is the terseness. All right, next one is rhyme. Okay, normally rhyming is... Um, uh, you know, we would think of rhyming as similar sounding words. We use rhymes in songs all the time. Okay. So, but uh, for rhymes, it should be clear that Hebrew poetry is readily translated as it is the thoughts and images that rhyme, not the words. This rhyming of ideas is called parallelism. Parallelism. Okay. So the rhyming in English and in Malayalam uh, or in different languages uh, for poetry, the rhyming will be according to the, uh, according to the, um, uh, the sound. And so you would have similar sounding words. And uh, so each line would begin with a similar sounding word or each line would end with a similar sounding word. So there is a rhyme uh, in, in, uh, in poetry. But in Hebrew poetry, it is not the rhyme of that type, but rather it is a rhyme that is a rhyming of ideas. And that rhyming of ideas is often called parallelism. Parallelism, all right? And uh, we'll talk about parallel, we'll talk about different types of parallelism, and I'm just giving you a basic idea of what parallelism is. This parallelism may be semantic and or grammatical. Okay, in other words, it could be the usage of words. Second, Hebrew poetry uses all the figures of speech of English poetry, metaphors, similes, we'll talk about what these are, personification, etc., in very unique and striking ways. Okay, more. Vivid word pictures are a characteristics 
of the Hebrew language. These are all different aspects of how poetry in Hebrew is used. Okay, so rhyming, we don't have the natural type of rhyming, but there is rhyming in the form of, uh, of parallelism. It's a rhyme of thought. There is my alarm, and uh, I'll try to finish it within five minutes so we can have this, um, yeah, we can have a, like about an 18 to 20 minute video. All right, so rhyme. Okay, next, then we'll look at different types of parallelism. All right, maybe I'll stop this video with this type of parallelism, and then we'll see how this, uh, this works out for one day of class. If needed, we could do more. Let's see uh, uh, for the next day. All right, synonymous parallelism is the first type. What does synonymous parallelism mean? What is it? What is it? It repeats the thought in synonymous terms. Okay, synonymous has the word synonym. Okay, it repeats the thought in synonymous terms. Okay, here is here are two examples: Deuteronomy chapter thirty-two, verse one and two. Hear, O heavens, and I will speak. Hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. Let my teaching fall like rain, and my words descend like dew, like showers on new grass, like abundant rain on tender plants. So synonym is basically two words with the same meaning, okay? Or two phrases with the same meaning, but using different words, okay? Hear, O heavens, and I will speak. Okay, there is one phrase right there. Here, I will, so I want you to watch what is happening here. Hear, O heavens, and I will speak. So he's like talking to the heavens. Hear, O heavens, and I will speak. Okay, then, hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. So I, I want you to see the parallelism there. So first you have heavens and then you have earth. Okay, so he's talking to the heavens and to the earth, to everything that is there. Here are heavens, here are earth. And then in the second part of the first, second part of the first phrase, and I will speak. Second part of the second phrase, the words of my mouth. See, so the speaking, words of my mouth, similar, synonyms. So there are two synonyms, and those two synonyms are being put together. So this is a, a certain type of parallelism. It is synonymous parallelism. Hear, O heavens, and I will speak. Hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. Okay, now keep on. Let my teaching fall like rain, and my words descend like dew. So here are two things, same uh, similar ideas, but in two different ways of saying it. Let my teaching fall like rain, and my words descend like dew. Okay? More. Like showers on new grass, like abundant rain on tender plants. Okay? Uh, in actuality, you could actually take this and put it as, uh, I, I guess I could have put it uh, in, a, you know, in, a, in a diagram form, and uh, you'll be able to see that. And uh, let's see, I, I might be able to, but I, I won't take the time to do that right now. Kind of make it as a diagram where hero heavens, and I will speak. Hero earth, the words of my mouth. So basically, it's parallelism, putting it together. All right? Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 1 and 2. Another one is uh, Proverbs chapter 11, verse 25. A generous man will prosper. All right, so here's one idea. A generous man will prosper. He who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. So here is the same thing said in two different formats, okay? Two different ways of saying the same thing. So here is a generous man and he who refreshes others, same thing. Will prosper, okay? So that generous man will prosper and himself will be refreshed, okay? He himself will be refreshed. So there are two phrases giving the same idea in parallel thought. They're all, it's synonymous parallelism, all right? What does synonymous parallelism do? It repeats the thought in two different forms. All right, so let me just review what we talked about today very quickly, and uh, we'll talk about this uh, 
Monday morning at 8.30. Hope and Suffering, Joy and Liberation. It's a study of Hebrew poetry and wisdom literature. Here are the objectives. We'll look at the polyphonic character of Hebrew poetry and wisdom traditions. In other words, various, uh, there are different variations or there are different characteristics uh, of Hebrew poetry and wisdom traditions. We'll look at that. Next, we'll look at different themes in the writings. Or particularly, we'll look at the themes in Hebrew poetry and wisdom writings. Third, we'll study in detail the book, one of these two, Job or Psalms. Next, we'll do exegesis uh, based on contextual and liberative readings. And uh, we'll do the exegesis um, on passages that has been given. So first section, we'll be looking at Hebrew poetry. And uh, under Hebrew poetry, we're talking about genres first. Genre, uh, specifically in this subject or in this course, we're talking about features and characteristics of Hebrew poetry. Okay. Um, <clears throat> normally, genre would be like uh, history, would be a particular genre, poetry would be a particular genre, or uh, narrative would be a particular genre, and, uh, but that's a different type of usage for the word genre. But here, in this subject, we're looking at features and characteristics of Hebrew poetry. So first we talk about what is terseness. So terseness is one of the characteristics that is very brief, concise, and it's pithy language, and it's giving it to you very simple and direct. All right? Uh, we looked at the sample from judges. And then rhyme. We talked about what is rhyme. But rhyming normally is with similar sounding words. But in Hebrew poetry, we're talking about rhyming, rather uh, rhyming not of, not of um, uh, the sounds, but rather rhyming of thought and ideas. Okay? So we're looking at um, uh, different types of parallelism. Okay? So the rhyming in Hebrew poetry, let me go back here, is rhyming of ideas called parallelism. All right? So first we're talking about synonymous parallelism. We'll talk about several types of parallelism. And this time we will only go up to the synonymous parallelism. Synonymous parallelism repeats the thought in synonymous terms. So the same thought is given in two different terms. And we looked at two different passages to give us samples of that. And uh, we've gone through that as well. All right. And uh, next uh, video will, or the next lecture, we'll go into different um, types of parallelism. We'll continue with that. So I hope this will give you kind of an introduction to what this is, um, this subject is, and, uh, and we'll talk more uh, in the class tomorrow. Thank you and have a great day. Please make sure to watch this video uh, before you gather for the class. Thank you. Have a good evening.